Uh, just right at the start there, you touched on uh, living through the Second World War. You were quite young when that happened, and I understand you spent some time in a prison camp in Italy. How old were you? Well, I was um, uh, 11 when, um, when we were put in a concentration camp because uh, my father had been working for the former Hungarian government that was implicated in the war, and he was a uh, consul general in Venice, in Italy. And uh, so uh, it wasn't clear how much he had been involved in, in the war, and so we were put in that camp to be... Uh, to be uh, wetted, in a sense, to be found out. And after seven months, um, uh, he was released with apologies, saying actually it turned out that he had helped many people escape as counsel. People were persecuted by the Nazis. And he gave uh, passports and visas to people who were persecuted and so they could go to Spain or Portugal, and then from there to the safer places of the world. So, but uh, it was it was um, actually the the scariest part was just before uh, the end of the war. Then uh, bombings and uh, um, threat of uh, guerrillas, uh, partisans, and then the Russian troops moving from the east. Uh, it, it, was, it was kind of scary. Yeah. How did you find a form of escape while you were in that prison camp? Well, yeah, that's uh, the beginning. That's when I first uh, realized that, for instance, um, I was nine, nine and a half years old, roughly, when an uncle taught me how to play chess. And I discovered that playing chess was like moving into a separate reality, temporarily, anyway. And uh, there could be bombs falling next door and the houses collapsing. But, but if you had a good chess game, you would hardly notice. You know, and, and, uh, Is that and where you, I don't know, maybe had your first acquaintance with flow? I mean, it sounds, what you're describing well, this sounds a lot yeah, like flow. Yeah, it was one, one way. Uh, and, uh, later on, when um, I didn't have much money after the war, and. Uh, um, I ended up with a, a group of climbers in Italy, and we started climbing in the Alps and Dolomites, and that, that's another uh, heritage <laughs> of the flow theory in some ways, because I realized there, too, that suddenly, when we were on the rock, the fact that you have lost everything and you had no hope of a great future, uh, uh, you, you still could uh, um, get immersed in something that you felt was expressing who you were in a way. And, and uh, that those were things that got me to realize there is this way of living that um, is available in case you need it, you know. And, I said, and then I realized that you can do it all the time. It wasn't just uh, when you climb rock or play chess, but uh, being, you know, for instance, one of the one of the most readily available forms of flow, which we don't use almost at all, is family life. You know, I mean. Uh, most people end up uh, feeling kind of bored at home, usually. Uh, they want to be home from work because work um, is not supposed to be enjoyable and, and home life would be free. You can do whatever you want and then you get home and you don't know what to do. So you turn on the telly and, and do, uh, immerse yourself in a kind of a state of apathy, which uh, takes your mind away from problems, but it's, in the long run, it's not very, very conducive. So after the war had finished, then, was the area around you, there were bomb cities, there were 
people who were barely alive and those people had lost family members and friends. What was the general kind of misery that was all around you then? What got you thinking about happiness in the first place? <clears throat> well, I think one of the... First of all, I was nine, ten years old at the very end, so I wasn't a keen observer of human uh, uh, <laughs> nature. So I, I'm not sure I had a good, good view of what was happening, but what I noticed, I suppose, is that, um, for instance, suddenly, towards the end of the war, all of my... Uh, all of the grown-ups, not all, but uh, the large number of the grown-ups in our family um, started reading Nostradamus and the prophecies uh, from the, uh, you know, the 14th century uh, seer, uh, kind of uh, magus from uh, France who thought he could predict what would happen in the next 500 years. And instead of listening to the radio or the, uh, or the radio didn't tell you what was happening, that's one thing. Uh, uh, but th there was no, no understanding of what was happening. Even the adults around me were like children. And um, the, uh, they became very selfish, they became um, kind of, uh, uh, they would get irritated very quickly. And it was um, a kind of a general uh, a mental illness that the whole culture had. And, and nobody was really talking about the real issues because they were afraid of talking about it. The, the best information about the future that I had was uh, a boy who was two years older than I, and he was the son of the janitor in our building. He was taken care of, and he was saying, you know, where uh, you live now, we will move up there, and you will be living down here, and that's, that's how it's going to be. And, and he, he could tell me things about what was happening in Russia and the United States that I had no idea, and which was kind of, um, there was a denial, uh, uh, which I realized people were denying the reality around them. They were uh, putting their hopes in very unreasonable, like Nostradamus, you know, what, what the heck did he know about it? <laughs> um, Not so as much anyway. as the boy downstairs, no. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about the first time you were introduced to psychology when you went to a lecture in Zurich. Yeah, that was um, when I was 15, 16 in Italy, and by then I had left school. I left school when I was 13, and uh, I never uh, finished... Uh, high school or anything, I went back to college by taking an equivalence exam when I was 33, 23 years old. But there was a gap of 10 years during which I worked, and I saved money, and finally I got enough money to go skiing to Switzerland. And uh, I stayed in a, a youth hotel, hostel, which was very cheap. And I didn't have much money, but, and then it turned out that I ended up at a bad time because the snow was already mel melting, and it was a um, kind of global warning. <laughs> but um, so I didn't know what to do. The movies were too expensive, and uh, uh, in the newspaper there was. I lo looked and I found that there was a guy going to talk about flying saucers at the university. And this was the period when uh, all over Europe there were uh, reports of sightings of UFOs. And I thought, well, okay, that's, uh, it will be warm, it will be free, and uh, it will be about flying saucers. That sounds like a good combination. 
So I went there, and the guy turned out to be a very strange person because he <laughs> talks not about real little green men or anything like that, but about our need to, the European need to reconnect with a kind of a wholeness, a wholeness of ethical, uh, spiritual, uh, which was shattered by the war. And so what we did was, we imagined seeing uh, these uh, saucers, flying saucers, which were really parts of the archetype on which the mandala, the Hindu notion of uh, the unity of the cosmos uh, was based, that the mandala is a circle that unites everything in the cosmos. And we imagined seeing these things flying. So it didn't make any sense to me, but I realized that the guy was onto something very important, which was uh, what happened to Europe as a result of the destructions of the war and the horrors that went on before it and after it. So I, I took note of the name of the guy who talked, and I found out that he had written some other books, and I, some books. And so I started reading them, and he was Carl Jung, who uh, was uh, one of the... Uh, so Carl Jung introduced you to psychology. <laughs> yeah. At a lecture about flying saucers <laughs> in Zurich. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've, got to, we've all got to start going to those lectures when we see them advertised in the paper. We don't know what kind of life-changing experience will, yeah, will come yeah, out of that. So, so what was it about that that then made you think you might want to have a life in psychology? Well, yeah, for a long, long time I didn't think that uh, I had any... First of all, I haven't finished high school and I was working in Italy. But... Um, then, uh, finally, we got, uh, you know, uh, everybody from Eastern Europe who was in Italy wanted to go somewhere else because Italy had been ruined by the war, too, and there was nothing to do. Uh, you couldn't get a work permit. You had to work kind of under on the black market, so to speak. So um, everybody applied to visas to, I think the number one destination was actually New Zealand. Uh, everybody wanted to be in New Zealand. Then Australia, and then United States, and then in decreasing order, all the other uh, parts of South, uh, Canada and South America. So we applied for visas, and suddenly uh, we were on the list. We were called, my father, my mother, and sister. And, uh, and um, my parents really didn't want to go to the US. So I said, well, why, maybe if I go to, uh, to America, I can get, uh, continue my education and try to figure out more what this guy in Zurich had been saying, uh, of not about flying saucers, but about what people lost as a result of the war and what, why people were so destroyed when they lost the material supports of their existence and so forth. So, um, so I applied and after a while I got the visa to come here, whereas my parents and sister went to Belgium where my father became, um, found a very nice job uh, as a librarian to a monastery that makes the second best beer <laughs> there was no position at the place that makes the very best beer. <laughs> yeah. And can I have that job? <laughs> Just go on. So your father went from being a diplomat to being a librarian in a monastery? Well, yeah. he was ambassador in Rome until 1948. Um, and in 1948, the Central Party, Central Party, which was the smallholders, um, had an election, and the communists won, uh, had 17% of the vote, 17, and the smallholders had like 62%. But 
But because Hungary was invaded by Soviet troops, they found a way of putting all the elected people from the large party, the center party, in jail for one reason or another. And the only people left in the political arena were the, <laughs> the communists. So you don't so have to run for his life pretty much then, in other words, yeah, to get out of yeah, the Soviet, uh, communist was, Hungary. Uh, so anyway, that was in February of 48. And my father, at that point, was recalled to Budapest to, to get uh, retrained for the new government. And he decided, no, I better stay out here. And so he was indicted and uh, sentenced to death for not coming back. But he didn't come back, so it, it was OK. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> happened. He, they couldn't get him. So about three years ago, I was very pleased to be called back to Budapest and be given a big prize by the president of the republic for scientific contribution for the well-being of mankind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're speaking about flow, is it something that's just pretty much a thing for artists and sports people and creative people, or is it something that's available to everyone? Uh, uh, by itself, flow isn't ethical. Is, is that what you're asking? I'm saying, can anyone experience this, or is it really oh. for creative people or oh, oh, high no, achieving no, people? No, no I, think, I think it's very simple. I, I mean, if you, for instance, um, read the Tolstoy, Anna Karenina, uh, there's a chapter that begins with, uh, OK, uh, Levin, who is the husband of Anna at the time, is a big landowner. Yeah. And he's looking out of the window, and he sees his, his uh, serfs uh, cutting the grass with the sides, you know. And the way they move, and the way they laugh and joke as they move and sing. And he said, oh my god, I, I never feel this happy myself. What can I do to? Uh, to, to experience it. So he says, he walks out and he asks uh, one of the old uh, farmer peasants to give him a sight and starts doing it. And within five minutes, he's all sweaty and, and, and his muscles are hurting and he, he stumbles and falls and everybody laughs. And so he goes immediately back and says, that's not for me. Um, I think everything can be flow-like. I think uh, hunter-gatherers are probably used to be in flow most of the time when they were chasing the prey or f trying to find the fruits in the, in the forest. But then, you know, uh, if you look at the evolution of human technology, probably one of the worst periods was in the late 1700s uh, when Industrial Revolution started uh, rationalizing work so that people became simply serving these machines that were uh, completely moving by themselves. And you had to, in England in, uh, in the 1760s or so, Children had to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to start their shift at the mechanical looms and, and uh, arrive there and, and work for 10, 12 hours. And at that point, you know, they lost whatever flow potential they had. And the only way to survive was to work and sleep and drink in between, you know. Um, so it's possible. I think we are all equipped to enjoy what we have, either, either uh, body or mind. And to the extent that we have the opportunity to use our body and our mind, we are going to uh, 
find flow. Um, unfortunately, what we find, for instance, in America, also, uh, the very first consulting job I had was from a um, sheriff of a county just uh, west of Chicago who asked me to come and try to explain why it happened that so many teenagers in their community ended up stealing cars, breaking into, breaking into houses, uh, defacing, uh, burning down the school, etc. This was a very rich neighborhood, um, a community of doctors, professionals, businessmen. But the, the boys had nothing to do, and the girls not either, but for boys, having to do something uh, is more important in a, in a sense as they grow up, something physical, something difficult, or, uh, challenging. And if they can't find it, if they are very good athletes, they can find it in the school team. But if they are not, and they are not geniuses intellectually, then they don't feel they can express anything they can do. So the first interview I had was with a 16-year-old boy who told me uh, he was the son of a banker and the mother was a teacher. And he told me, you know, if you can tell me what I could do that's as much excitement and fun as breaking into a house without waking up the people who are there and stealing the jewels without being uh, noticed and go out with the jewels, which I don't need. I, I don't know what to do with them. I just hide, I hid them in the backyard. But, but the fact, the thing was the challenge of going and stealing, even though you don't need it, you know? So that, we, we need to have opportunities for using our brains and our bodies. But, but other than that, I think it's built into us too. It seems to me that um, video games play on that sense of flow and the addictive qualities to it. What do you think about that and the video games, the way they try and bring the game player into that sense of flow to the point where you, you can be sitting there in, in your underpants all day in front of a, in front of a screen, sitting there sort of slack to it. I mean, I've done it myself, so I'm not getting sanctimonious here. Um, and I'm not sure that's entirely healthy when it goes on for several days. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, yeah, I, I feel kind of conflicted because according to the video game makers, they are basing a lot of their games on flow. What they say they're basing it on flow? They use the word flow? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, they're using your research to make games more addictive? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, that's one of the downfalls of discovering something is that if it's usable in one way or the other, it will be used. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I think video games as a transitional uh, activity are not really that bad in the sense that it, it gives you a, a sense of control. Uh, you have to be very quick and uh, observant and, uh, and that's not bad, but if you don't get the next step, something more interesting, more active to do after that, you get cooked in that one uh, opportunity to experience flow, then it's, it's really a bad thing. And uh, I, I hope that uh, you know, young people will find But uh, you know, it's, it's a problem universally. Uh, for instance, one of my students went to teach in Saudi Arabia and, and uh, he got his job by the University of Riyadh partly because he had studied flow with me and, and he started looking at what people did for flow in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and found that the most important form of flow for young people was to drive out in the desert in the, one of the father's Mercedes or Rolls Royces and, and then 
race in the dune, sand dunes and uh, turn around and ruin the car. But that was because there was this long tradition of racing, but it used to be camel racing. And a young man felt that he, he could show how good he was by racing camels with other young people. But camels are kind of out of style now, and so <laughs> you, know, you go with, 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 the, uh, with the rolls. <laughs> You know, you mentioned there um, the character uh, Anna Karenina and the character of Levin there, and and really, you know, he's he's actually based on Tolstoy himself. He's the stand-in character for the the author there, and really, so much of that novel, uh, the the subplot of that novel is Levin trying to find a way of being happy in the world, and he only <laughs> achieves it once, really, yeah. which is when he does that day's labour with the peasants in the field cutting cutting grass. Yeah. At the end of it, as you say, he experiences this flow and he feels this absolute state of Oh, ecstasy, and it, it just, it's... Then he sort of goes on, and he seems to forget all about it. That's the funny thing. He, he doesn't remain mindful of, that was the thing that made him happy. Yeah. And he gets married, and that makes him happy for a couple of days, and he's miserable, and, you know, <laughs> back and forth. But it seems really easy to forget the lesson of that we can find that happiness we're looking for in that state of flow. Yeah, well, Tolstoy had this thing about happiness and uh, one one little book that uh, we use at the introduction of uh, the psychology I teach at in Claremont is uh, another Tolstoy book called The Death of Ivan Illich, mm -hmm. which is the biography of uh, a judge who is um, now suffering of apparently uh, pituitary cancer, according to doctors. I don't know if it is. And he's rem remembering his life, which, again, in his life also, the only thing he remembers as being close to flow is sledding as a boy of seven down the hills of uh, his grandfather's home. And he says, Dad, that's when I really felt happy. And since then, nothing, you know? And he, because he got caught in the social definition of happiness, which was to have good clothes, sell clothes made in France, possibly, having a good job, having a beautiful house, having this and that. And the, the fact that he, that wouldn't make him happy, nobody in his environment believed. Everybody believed that to be happy, you have to have a good job, a good uh, home and everything. That's what happiness was about. And of course, that was, in fact, the euro that collapsed after, first after World War I, and then re-collapsed in World mm. War II. And hopefully, by now, uh, two collapses will be enough uh, to learn the lesson that you can't be happy just by living a comfortable life. Uh, better than most other people, and uh, you don't care what the other people below you do or how they, they all you want to do is move up and uh, have even more of the luxuries than you have. But that kind of life is not sustainable, you know? And uh, I just hope we learn it before it's too late. Hi, it's been lovely speaking with you. Please, ladies and gentlemen, please thank me. Hi, you said me hi. <laughs>